Now we are ready to grind through the math that is necessary for solving the series RLC circuit response. Now recall that we came up with a notion that the response would be of the form V C of T is equal to V S minus V S cosine omega. I'm gonna I'm not gonna call it omega n, I'm just gonna go I'm gonna leave that blank. We don't know exactly what the frequency is here. Um, it, it seems like it'd be omega n, uh, but we'll leave that times e to the minus t over tau. All right, so we had a constant. That's a particular solution. And then we have this exponentially decaying solution, uh, which is our homogeneous or transient solution. So that's what we're going to look for uh, as we proceed solving this. So let's draw our circuit. We have Vs, R, L, C to find the voltages. VR, VL, and VC. And our current I, or IL, or IC, they're all the same, right, because it's in series. Now notice I've called this solving for the series RLC. And the reason is that uh, there is another form, which is very, once you've solved one, it's a small step to solve the other one. But you could have the three in parallel. Right? When you only have two elements, like an RC or an RL, you can't really talk about having them in series or in par parallel because they're really effectively always in series and in parallel because there's just two elements. But when you get three together, you can actually talk about whether the three are in series or the three are in parallel. So we're doing the series RLC circuit, and we'll take a look at the parallel later. Okay, so let's write our uh, equations of motion. Remember, our steps are going to be write the equations of motion, which will lead to the differential equation. Find the particular solution, step two. Find the homogeneous solution, step three. And find the complete solution by uh, combining homogeneous and particular and solving for initial conditions is our step four. So let's do KVL. And I'm going to go clockwise. So we have minus VS plus VR plus VL plus VC is equal to zero. I'm going to throw the uh, VS on the other side because I know that's where I want it in the end. VR is just R times I, I'll, I'll write IL, plus VL is L DI uh, DT plus VC. Now I'm going to write this in terms of VC, so I'm keeping VC around. Recall that IL is equal to IC, which we can express in terms of the capacitor voltage, C dV dt. So we plug that in, and we'll have RC dV C dt plus LC, and we've seen this term before, second derivative of the capacitor voltage with respect to time, plus VC is equal to zero. All right, let me rearrange this. I'll go from highest term to lowest term, and let me divide. So let's do this. We'll divide by LC. You don't have to, but I just I like to, to write it this way. So we'll have the second derivative of the capacitor voltage plus, what are we going to have? L over R of the derivative of the capacitor voltage plus 1 over LC times VC is equal to 0. This is our homogeneous equation, which we have to find, for which we have to find a solution. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Correct. Uh -uh. Uh, I forgot. I have VS. That is not my homogeneous solution. Uh, or some homogeneous equation. I apologize. Here we go. This is our our differential equation that describes the system. Uh, and then I just realized I need to, if I'm going to divide through, I need to put LC down here. Okay. So now let's look at uh, the particular solution. We've already found it uh, in the previous lectures where we solve for a particular solution from a circuit perspective. But let's go ahead and try it anyway, just to be thorough. So let's assume that VCP, particular solution, is equal to some constant K. We'll plug it in. We'll try it. And we're going to have the second derivative of K uh, plus L over R, first derivative of K, plus 1 over LC times K is equal to VS over LC. This is 0. This is 0. And sure enough, K is equal to Vs, so therefore Vc particular is equal to Vs as we had expected. Now let's solve for the homogeneous solution. Now we can write our uh, homogeneous differential equation. 
where we have uh, vc double dot second derivative, right? A vc plus l over r first derivative of the capacitor voltage plus one over lc vc is equal to zero. And uh, like before, we are going to uh, try a solution form. Let me put h here. H, h. Try vc of ch of t as a e to the st. All right, so we'll plug it in. So we'll plug it in, and we'll get, when we take the second derivative, we'll get s squared out front. When we take the first derivative, we'll get s, and we see that we have the same a e to the st throughout. So let's collect terms and factor out the a e to the st. And this here, I think as has been mentioned before, this is the characteristic equation. It tells us everything about the natural or homogeneous transient response. It's very important. So we need to find the roots of the characteristic equation uh, because for this equality here, this uh, characteristic equation times a e to the st equal to zero to be true for all time, we need that characteristic equation to be true, to be zero. All right, it's quadratic, so we need to solve s squared plus l over r s plus one over l c is equal to zero. So the solution is going to be of the form s is equal to minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac AC over 2a. Um, and I can write this as minus b over 2a plus or minus b squared over 4a squared minus c over a. All right, I can write it that way as well. All right, let's find the roots then. S is equal to minus L over 2R, right? This is uh, minus uh, B over 2 plus or minus the square root of B squared over 4, A. A is 1 here. So that would be uh, 2R, I could square it like that, minus C, this here. Okay, we're going to, this is a little cluttered, so let's define some terms here. So let's define one. We've already defined omega n, all right, but we'll just write it again. It's one over square root of LC. Let's also define a term called alpha, and we'll say that is one half L over R. Then the roots are going to be, and I'll write S1 comma S2, because there's actually two values of S because of the plus and minus. There are two values of S for which um, the characteristic equation will go to zero, which means, therefore, that our homogeneous uh, differential equation will be satisfied. So this will be minus alpha plus or minus square root of alpha squared minus omega n squared. See, much cleaner, right? Where we'd say alpha is equal to one half L over R and omega n is equal to one over square root of LC. So these are our roots. Now, before we go any further, let's check this result against uh, the LC, i.e. r equals zero solution. So let's uh, let r is equal to z r equals zero, which leads to uh, rats. I just realized I have a I have a typo in all of this. I've been writing L over R. It's actually R over L. Let's let me correct that here and go back and correct it on the previous page. It's probably you probably noticed it a long time ago. So let me go back to the previous page and uh, I'll say correction here. This is R over L right here. And this is R over L here, R over L here, R over L, R over L, 
Okay. Apologize for that. So we let, it's a good thing we checked here. Let r equal zero. This leads to alpha being zero. And so S1 and S2 become plus or minus square root of minus j omega n squared or plus or minus j omega n. And this checks with what we found previously. Now let's take a closer look at uh, these roots. Notice that S1 and S2 may or may not be complex. It's going to depend on alpha. All right, so we have several cases. Consider alpha equal to zero. So that's what we had looked at before. Roots uh, S1 and S2 are purely imaginary. All right. What if alpha is greater than omega n? So if it's greater than omega n, then the radical uh, is greater than zero, and so the square root is a real number. So we have real and distinct, meaning different valued, the two roots will be different valued, real and distinct roots. If we have alpha less than omega n, then we would have uh, complex and distinct roots, and actually they will be, uh, they'll actually be complex, I should have written this complex conjugate, actually let me write it here, complex conjugate roots, right, because the real part, the minus alpha will be the same, it's the plus or minus j uh, term that will be uh, different. So it's just complex conjugate. And then we can consider a case, what if alpha is equal to omega n? In that case, we have the roots would be minus alpha plus or minus zero because the, the, in, the radical would, uh, would evaluate to zero. So this would lead to real repeated roots. So for instance, if it turns out that alpha is equal to one, then we have two roots, one at minus one and another root at minus one. Now we can group these together uh, according to, I think what we have already discussed, uh, being underdamped response and an overdamped response and then a critically damped response. All right, so an underdamped response occurs when the roots are complex. In other words, alpha is less than omega n, and this will become apparent as we go through the analysis. Uh, this may not be obvious to you at this point, but I'm going to go ahead and state it now. Roots are complex. Okay. Overdamped is when alpha is greater than omega n, and therefore roots are real and distinct. And when alpha is equal to omega n, roots are roots are real and repeated. All right. The critically damped case is for a single value of alpha, whereas the underdamped and overdamped are both uh, a broad or semi-infinite range of, uh, of values.